All right. So it's my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our seminar speaker for today, Noah Kerensky. Uh, so Noah uh, is a uh, longtime collaborator of mine since we were both up at um, in the Chicago area. Uh, so Noah got his PhD from Stanford, did a postdoc at Fermilab, which is where I met him, um, and then moved to become staff scientist at Slack, uh, recipient of the DOE Early Career Award uh, last year for his work kind of connecting quantum sensors to uh, rare particle and event detection um, and in particular, dark matter, which is what I've worked on um, a lot with Noah. So we're members of a, a collaboration also involving Peter Abmonte and his group, um, funded by Los Alamos to look for interesting new materials to look for dark matter. Um, but to do any of that, you actually need to find a signal if it if it is there. And that's what we're going to hear about today using these really interesting tools of quantum sensors to uh, look for really low energy rare stuff. Thanks, Yoni. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me here today. So. Uh, I'm not going to talk that much about dark matter. I really am going to talk a lot about the um, the actual strategies that we use to to look for it. Um, so I'll spend like three or four slides giving enough intro on dark matter so you can understand the the magnitude of the measurement problem. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we've done so far at EV scales, and then um, how we go to the milli EV scale, um, what I like to call the single quasi particle scale for quantum sensing, um, specifically in the context of very rare events. So not pump probe experiments, not bolometry, but <clears throat> looking for a uh, few events per day. Um, <clears throat> this is my only slide and one is dark matter. So uh, we're going to assume many things. We're going to assume that there is a thing that that makes up uh, roughly a quarter of the energy density of the universe that is called dark matter. We're going to assume it's a particle. We're going to assume it's produced in the early universe and that we roughly understand its kinematics. So these are all many assumptions that you could quibble with. Um, uh, I'm going to redirect all of those questions to uh, Yoni and Jesse, and you can go for ask them. I'm sure you know where their offices are. Um, uh, in this talk, we'll not assume that it fits into a specific theory um, or that interactions can be described elastically. So basically, we, we think we know what the energy scales are. We don't know exactly what the energy is, but for, for different sets of energy scales, we have an idea of how it interacts and roughly what the rate should be. Um, and specifically for low mass dark matter, so below the proton mass, um, things get very interesting theoretically. And as someone who makes sensors, um, the challenges get more interesting and uh, more acute. So we can't use conventional um, particle detectors. We have to start inventing our own particle detectors. Um, there's been a lot of theory work done on the space of dark matter masses down to about a keV in particle uh, mass, and then actually to much lower energies for something called axion. Um, the interesting thing about these new regimes are that the event rates start to become something closer to an AMO or condensed matter experiment rather than a ginormous particle experiment. So um, <clears throat> for something like a, a 30 MeV dark matter particle at this uh, cosmic generation target we have in our dark matter cross-section versus mass space, you can start to imagine rates at the scale of hertz per kilogram or down at the lowest masses, um, hertz per gram of fiducial mass. So when I started in dark matter, my first experiment, we were working with 30 kilograms of germanium in a mine a mile and a half deep, running for three or four years, expecting to see one event. Now we're talking about things you can do in a basement lab with a dill fridge and some lead blocks. And really the challenge is getting um, getting to the point where you can see these events energetically rather than building up a, gi a giant experiment and running for a decade. Um, <clears throat> so as someone who really likes the microphysics of uh, sensors, this is very exciting for me. Um, and it also allows you to, um, in a smaller group, spend a lot more time thinking about how to actually detect interesting types of events with new types of sensors and do some real science um, uh, at the sort of single group setting. So. Um, <clears throat> Just to set a sense of scale, this is where we've been living in dark matter land for a few decades. We've been looking at the GeV scale. Energies are KeV. Um, in the near term, we're starting to probe this region. So this is a proton mass down to an electron mass. Um, there are two things that happen here that sort of point the way forward for the dark matter field. One is that at high masses, these solid lines are dominant. This is nuclear scattering. You want heavy targets. Um, you're, you're generating a lot of energy. So we have um, at high masses, big liquid xenon tanks. And at low masses, there's two other, there's sort of two changes that happen. One, when you're below the proton mass, kinematics flip. You can now get much better momentum transfer to the electron system. And you can th start to think of dark matter detection as uh, particles interacting with a free electron gas. So this frees you up from 
um, worrying so much about a specific nuclear mass. And now you start to think about electron dynamics, how to manipulate electron dynamics in order to uh, mediate better uh, momentum transfer. Um, and the other thing it does is it tells you that your interactions are non-local and you can actually start to use a lot more of your con condensed matter tools that you might be familiar with from um, more conventional AMO experiments. So in this talk, we, we were focused on some techniques to fill in this, this middle energy gap between resonant searches that use conventional um, uh, RF techniques and the, the more traditional ATP techniques. And this is really the um, a golden opportunity for quantum information based techniques. So above where you can do coherent wavefront sensing, below where you can do single particle detection, um, and where you, you start to have very light particles or photon absorption in this milli EV to EV range. Um, and in particular, at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about three new experiments. Uh, well, two new experiments and one very old experiment, but in particular, R&D we're doing um, to lower our mass thresholds. This first one is talking about using quantum materials to do light dark matter detection by finding materials with MEV scale gaps and then doing conventional charge detection. In super CDMS, we look at um, the direct detection of phonons in, in cryogenic substrates. And in particular, what I'll talk about is how we look, how we do uh, milli EV scale phonon detection. And in particular, what this means is we're doing single optical phonon detection stochastically. So not pump probe, but, but seeing every single optical phonon produced in a material over a given amount of time. And then there's last approach is the bread experiment where we're using a uh, broadband dish type concept to generate terahertz photons from dark matter axions um, and detect them with terahertz single photon detectors. Um, if you're interested in this whole subfield, we just in ATP went through a nice um, planning process called SNOMAS where we laid out um, different new directions within science. So in particular, this is a white paper I was involved in, which is the landscape of low threshold dark matter direct detection. But it really goes over how you go from GEV scales all the way down to KEV scales by introducing new technologies, um, starting with things that are more conventional and have moving to ionization detectors, which have really progressed over the last 30 years, and then on to new technologies. And in particular, when you get to these lowest masses, you have to use things like superconductors, superfluids, um, single photon detectors, um, heavy electron materials, things that are naturally ordered at the milli EV scale and have nice long lived excitations that are uh, conducive to being read out. So for the rest of the talk, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about what's going on at the EV scale, right? So like what has happened in these um, phonon and ionization detectors that have pushed them to the EV scale and then how do we access this region? Um, in particular, this is talking about dark matter scattering mass. This also applies to um, axion masses down to a little bit below a milli EV. So milli EV energy scales, very low dark matter mass, very rare events. <clears throat> so if I think schematically about if I have any sort of cryogenic material, what happens when a particle interaction occurs, I don't have that many options. <clears throat> um, the two options that are sort of most accessible to me are if that scattering event produces phonons, I can collect that phonon energy as heat, if I collect it fast enough, I can actually collect a thermal phonon. So they're not thermalized with the material. I, can, I, can, um, I can't necessarily detect the initial frequency, but once they get down to the optical phonon energy scale, I can pretty much um, accurately sense all of the phonons from that point on. We call these prompt phonons. I can also produce charge, right? And so a lot of the techniques, we, we, we use indirect gap semiconductors where the charge is long lived. You can drift the charge collect the charge and either read out the charge or apply a large bias voltage here um, to, uh, to, to produce more phonons. So let's talk about the first path. So what if I can produce a lot of phonons, but I can't collect charge? <clears throat> um, the technique we've been using pretty successfully for the last 10 years is uh, this, this phonon focusing technique. So I have phonons bouncing around a large substrate. I collect them in a bulk superconductor, in this case, aluminum has a, a very long diffusion length. Um, that breaks Cooper pairs, they become quasi-particles, they diffuse to a lower gap superconductor where they're trapped. So there's a proximity effect which produces a trapping into a very small volume, low TC superconductor, and I turn that superconductor into a sensor by essentially using the phonons to increase the quasi-particle density in the superconductor. And from there, if, if you're familiar with um, making superconducting devices, you know there's, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. Um, 
In ATP land, we've called them, everyone wants to call everything quantum. So there's quantum 1.0 and quantum 2.0. Quantum 1.0 means everything we were doing. Quantum 2.0 means everything we want to get funded now. Um, <clears throat> but in general, quantum 1.0 in, in, in my field means things that track quasi-particle density in a continuous sense. So you have transition edge sensors and MKIDs. These are um, resistance tracks quasi-particle density or inductance tracks quasi-particle density. <clears throat> but I think what's more exciting and more promising for this regime is the where the sensors track quasi-particle tunneling rate. So we've had things like superconducting tunnel junctions for a long time. However, there's a lot of new uh, work looking at um, quantum capacitance detectors and transmon qubits as sensors, right? So devices that in their intrinsic form are already counting single quasi-particle tunneling events. And if we can mediate better transport of energy to those junctions, we can actually use them as much more sensitive sensors. And they really are quantum, right? They're really, they're reading out quantum events. You can manipulate their states. You can do all sorts of quantum engineering to them in ways you can't do with the quantum 1.0 techniques. So I'm gonna talk about this paper in a little bit, but we're already seeing in what are otherwise conventional qubit chips that when you reduce um, methods of syncing athermal phonons, you see events in a pump probe scheme that look like phonon pulses that we see in quantum 1.0 sensors. So we'll come back to this, but um, this is the thing I'm most excited about and, and we'll talk about in more detail. There's this middle approach, which we've used actually pretty successfully over the past five or so years to do dark matter detection, and in particular do single charge readout. So imagine I can collect both charge and phonons. What I actually wanna do, what the most optimal technique is, is I want, to, I want to drift charge in a high field and I use each charge to produce a lot more phonons. So imagine I have one electron in say silicon, the gap there is 1.2 EV. So my energy cost is 1.2 EV. But if I put hundred volts across the crystal, now I have hundred EV of energy. So it's, a, it's essentially a phonon mediated gain. Um, and we've, we've demonstrated this technique first in 2017 at the single electron level. We've been using it in CDMS for about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> Here we have a TES based detector. It had an intrinsic 10 EV phonon resolution. Um, we put in different uh, pho uh, photon bunches, so 30 photon average bunch, six, and then we um, reduce the laser power <laughs> and we can start to see quantization of the photon signal at 50 volts. And you move this to 150 volts and you move the single electron peak out to 150 EV. <laughs> so, um, this technique has been very successful. We've achieved, I'll show in a second, um, we've achieved sub part in 100 charge resolution here. So this is the original device. Now these look like very sharp peaks. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then finally, there's this third mode, which, you know, the first two modes are essentially phonon detection. Um, the third mode is charge collection. So imagine I want to use a super weird material that doesn't really have very well defined phonon modes. This might be something with a very large unit cell, or maybe it does have, you know, decent phonons, but their lifetimes are very short because isotopic purity is not great in the material. So I want to try to drift charge. Ideally, I'd have some indirect gap, but um, if I want to find such a material where I could drift the charge, I need to be able to sense the charge. Um, and all of the sensors that we use, the charge induces some image charge on a sensor that converts it to a voltage. Um, again, there's quantum 1.0 everything we were doing. Quantum 2.0, again, we're using qubits to do this, right? So you can use something like a transmon qubit, where if I bias at a place where the even and odd states are separated in frequency space, um, I can see charge collection as drift on this applied offset charge, which is distinct from parity switching events. So uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of the talk, but this is also a, an interesting application. You're seeing a theme here, right? So there's a lot of ways we've been doing this um, using the, the tools of um, circuit QED, we can actually do uh, much better and we can produce more quantized signals that can better evade signal to noise um, in our experiments. So um, I have more slides on this. I don't want to talk about this right now, but essentially there's these three main tracks that we're pursuing. Um, they all have some pretty simple scaling relations for sensitivity. Um, so they're all superconductors um, for the first two cases where the sensitivity scales both with the volume of the device and the gap. So we still need to use some sort of focusing to get really low energy thresholds. In the tunneling case, the energy scales with essentially our ability to count tunneling events and their, the efficiency of quasi-particles to interact with the junction across which they're tunneling. Um, and in the charge case, this equation hasn't changed in, in maybe 70 years. 
uh, you want something with really small capacitance and you need to be able to read out um, very small image charges. So um, this is an overall strategy that we're using in the community to try to push down thresholds. And, and like I said, there, there, for each of these approaches, there exists a quantum 1.0 and a quantum 2.0 technique. And I think the quantum 2.0 techniques are a bit more promising as we'll see in a second. Um, so there is a fourth approach, which is collecting photons. There's a lot of reasons why um, at these energy scales, direct collection of photons or production of photons in substrates is not incredibly efficient. Um, at the end of the day, we end up converting the photons back into phonons or charges, and then we do the detection that way. So it's not really a distinct technique, and, and um, it will still be subject to all of the scaling bounds that we have on, on these measurement techniques. So um, for the bulk of the talk, I, I want to talk about where we're going, where we are and where we're going with phonon sensing. <clears throat> right. So we've been using silicon, germanium, sapphire. Um, for a lot of our devices, it, 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 both on the quantum side and the dark matter side for a long time. Um, and we have a pretty robust understanding of how to generate uh, and measure phonon energy in these devices at EV scales. So in particular for these HVV devices that are um, some of my older R&D devices, um, the, the same sort of logic applies to event creation. We apply this high voltage across the crystal where the total energy scales linearly with the voltage. Um, there's some dependence on how much charge is produced based on whether there's a nuclear scatter or an electron recoil. But at this, at these very small energy scales, essentially you either get an electron or you don't. We get this nice quantized readout. Um, we've been using tungsten TES based detectors. Um, they're fairly challenging to get this level of sensitivity. We tune them down to have critical temperatures in the 40 to 60 millikelvin range. So um, you start to reach the area where if your, uh, your cryostat degrades, um, the, 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 the measurement becomes more challenging. Um, but what, what has happened over the last five years is we've really, we really pushed these sensors to the ultimate limit. So we've gone from the schematic diagram to something that's fairly well optimized. Each of these, you have diffusion in the primary absorber, diffusion in the secondary trap, and then some sort of you know, minimized sensing volume where this whole process has been optimized to achieve the quantum limited sensitivity. So, you have um, a bunch of sort of fundamental limits on how much energy can actually make it to the TES. Um, you can only convert about 60% of the energy to quasi particles. There's some finite diffusion. We've pretty much gotten that to be almost perfectly efficient. And then you again have about a 50% uh, chance of converting energy into the, uh, the TES. This is really all defined just by what happens during quasi particle down conversion in the superconductor. So you're limited by the fundamental physics of what's going on in the sensor. We're limited to 30% efficiency. The question was, can we get there? Um, so we made a nice model of how this unit cell, as you scale the fin length and this trap length, um, the TS length, how the efficiency will vary. We took our design from um, an efficiency of expected efficiency of around 15% um, to 30%, fabricated a device that sort of obeyed these, these dimensions. Um, the nice thing with the TS is you can get you can actually you can actually measure the 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 energy you're absorbing in the TS. We're injecting photons of known energy, so we actually have a direct measurement um, of energy efficiency without having to rely on a, an external calibration. Um, and published this paper where we showed that we're getting very close to this thirty percent efficiency bound. So, for these devices, we basically optimize the signal collection aspect, and we've also pushed as part of this. Um, We've we've pushed the the maturity of the technology. So we've gone from something that looks like a mask that an undergrad drew, because an undergrad drew this mask, um, to something that actually was you know made by uh, well made by postdocs. So you know it's a, we're going in the right direction. Maybe version three would be made by a staff scientist. Who knows? Um, and so where where are we now? So right now we have devices. This is actually uh, not even the latest result. So. The most recent science results were based on this device with two and a half EV resolution. We run um, a continuous readout where we can do triggering offline. We can get triggers below 10 EV. Um, you can see each of the quantized charge events is much more distinct than the original device. We're starting to actually be able to measure inc incomplete charge collection in between peaks, um, do some physics with that. And now there's even analyses looking at what um, no charge phonon only events would look like um, between the zero and one electron peaks. So because we're looking at EV scale, um, uh, 
science targets, this region actually becomes interesting, and this whole technique beca becomes a way of rejecting any events that produce charge. Um, more recently, we are now actually approaching the EV scale. So this is a um, this is this is another detector that had a TC of about forty millikelvin. Right, we're we're actually pushing um, we're pushing so hard on this TC tuning to improve resolution because we we've we've gotten all the efficiency gains we're going to get. So we really have to make the smallest TS we can with the lowest heat capacity we can. Um, this achieved a resolution of about one EV. Um, the difference between this detector and this detector was three or four years of trying, lots of fab challenges. The difference between this one and the original one was some modeling and optimization. So it was about a year to get to this and about five years to get to this. That pace is not gonna get us to a milli EV, right? This is great, um, very successful. There's even a group at Berkeley that got to about um, 400 milli EV phonon collection uh, recently, but we're in the regime of like parasitic powers at the attawatt scale. This is becoming sort of increasingly untractable experimentally. And so the question is, where do we go next? <laughs> yeah. This is just... So the question is, where do the events come from? Yeah, where do the events come from? So... Um, these detectors are nicely self-calibrating and then they have a dark rate. So that's that's just dark rate. It uh, It's a long story, but the short story is it's scintillation photons from PCB material around the detector. So we have to, you know, our readout cable is like thin kapton and just from that thin kapton with a little bit of residual radioactivity, you get UV scintillation photons. Um, so there's a whole other, there's a theory paper on this and some follow-up measurements we've done that we verified that. So if you just replace everything in there with just copper and minimal wiring, you can drop this event rate a lot. Um, I kind of like it because it, we don't need an external fiber to do calibration. You get this really nice auto calibration from your dark rate. <laughs> yeah, all PCB materials are scintillators. They're all fiberglass. Um, this resolution is actually good enough that we did a follow-up study where, right, it's one EV, so event by event, you can't distinguish, but uh, you can look at the statistical distribution. So we subtract the electron energy from this peak. You can actually see a three and a four EV photon peak. And those are like the two scintillation energies in the particular uh, PCB we're using. So we're getting, we're getting energy resolutions that are low enough where you can do that sort of subtraction and, and actually estimate um, sub-EV scale systematics. So um, there's a lot of things people are trying now. Um, a lot of things my lab is doing as well. Um, so not enough time to talk about all of them, but I wanted to talk about this, this particular, particularly interesting application. So energy sensing with qubits and in particular phonon sensing with qubits. So the idea here is you have, you have a transmon, which is defined you know, to zeroth order by the, the James Cummings Hamiltonian, which gives you um, a sinusoidal dependence of the qubit transition frequency on applied offset charge to the qubit island. So, um, you know, for a for a sensor person, this is a, a nice thing to see. It's a, it's a in theory a behavior that you can calculate. You can replicate with data. The data is the 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 gray blocks behind the curves, and I can I can choose using this tunable variable how to read out my device. So I can sit at the degeneracy point here where I have high dependence of this frequency on charge. So I you know, DF, DQ is very high, or I can sit at a saddle point where DF, DQ is zero. And when I see a quasi-particle tunnel from um, one side of the junction to the other, I get a discrete shift to my transition frequency. So here I'm showing time streams from a pump probe experiment that uh, the Syracuse group, so Britton Plord's group did, um, which is some conventional qubits. They show that as you increase the energy injection rate into the substrate, you see a statistical increase in tunneling events. Um, there's a paper that will come out in about a month showing that these are indeed phonon events. Um, but in any, in any sense, this is something people are using. You, know, you can correlate qubit parity switching rate with energy injection. And um, some initial studies we did, um, we're just using regular transmont qubit chips. So this one, this is a chip made by Wisconsin. There are four qubits. Um, the questions here were twofold. One, uh, when you have a radiation event, how correlated are qubit errors? And two, are these charge-induced or phonon-induced? 
So what was done first was to um, measure the, the offset charge as a function of time and all the qubits. So you take, uh, for those of you who are less familiar with this technique, you initialize uh, your readout somewhere with a known charge offset, and then you do repeated um, Ramsey experiments in order to measure the drift in the qubit frequency from this initial starting point. So you can do that for all four qubits over the span of six to 10 hours. Um, and what you find is, for, for a lot of them, there are these correlated switching events. And the, the, the degree of correlation between switching events correlates also with the separation between um, the qubits. We took this a step further. We actually simulated using um, JAN4, which is a, an ATP software, muon and, and uh, gamma events in the substrate relative to these four qubit locations. Um, we drifted the subsequent charge um, from the initial events. That's shown in these um, uh, green and orange dots. This is electron hole diffusion. Um, and we were able to replicate with just data simulating radiation events all of the interesting um, spatial correlations in, um, in qubit errors. So this is showing that at least for the spatially correlated errors, this is charge mediated. Um, but for me, what was more interesting was um, the second part of the experiment. <laughs> so instead of looking at spatially correlated charge errors, what you do is you look at one qubit, you find a location where there is a large charge error, which we can now say with pretty good confidence correlates with a substrate event, so some large radiation event. Um, and what you see is a, is a decrease in the relative um, uh, coherence of the qubit, right? So you're increasing um, the, the decoherence rate, you're decreasing the probability of when you initialize the qubit in, in, in the excited state, you find it in the excited state later on. Um, and you can take a further leap and post, uh, postulate that this in increase in decoherence rate correlates with an increased um, quasi-particle density in the qubit generated by phonon absorption, right? So for me, this was a study we did back in like 2021. I looked at this and said, oh, look, qubits are phonon sensors. Okay, let's see how, how far we can go with this. Um, for the quantum community, I think the bigger takeaway was uh, every single radiation event in the substrate, anywhere in the substrate, spoils the coherence of the qubit. So there's been a lot of subsequent work. Um, this was sort of contemporary with another paper out of MIT showing this by uh, introducing a radiation source. They showed that um, the steady state coherence time was worse in a higher radiation environment. Um, there was a paper out of Google showing uh, in one of their Sycamore chips uh, tracks from cosmic rays. So um, this is now a known effect. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of work going into mitigating radiation effects in conventional qubits. Um, so, you know, we're working on some of that. Uh, a lot of that has to do, because now we all identify this as a phonon problem with introducing um, phonon sinks. So this is actually some nice work from uh, collaborators at Syracuse. They took a conventional qubit chip and they add a bunch of different types of phonon mitigations. So in this one, they're electroplating copper on the backside of an otherwise um, standard transmon qubit chip. Um, they inject different pulse lengths into uh, another junction, basically a junction radiator. Um, in the non-copper chip, you can see a pretty clear correlation between the injected energy as a, you know, length being a proxy for total energy, the injected energy and the switching rate. Um, you can see the same thing in the copper chips, but um, you need much larger pulse lengths to get up to the same level of quasi-particle poisoning and the overall switching probability. So the, the parity switching rate is lower. So essentially what this shows is if the first study showed us that we have um, phonon-induced decoherence, the second study shows you that in fact, when you better thermalize the athermal phonon population, you do improve the quality of the qubits. And then finally, they did this pump probe experiment where they look at coherence some finite time after the initial event, and they see for the chip without the athermal phonon mitigation, a pulse that looks almost identical to what I see in all my phonon sensors. So the rise time is, is basically dictated by the distance from the radiator, and the fall time is dictated by the thermalization rate of the phonons in the substrate. So <laughs> something that's interesting for the quantum community, this is more interesting for me. So the question after this study was done was, can we optimize this? How, how 
efficiently can you capture phonon energy? Um, and how would you design a qubit to actually read out the energy instead of doing this parasitically on top of something that's really designed for a different application? Um, <clears throat> so there's two studies that are underway now. Um, one, we, we took the simulations that were done for the previous paper. We actually did an entirely just a, a theoretical study of for different mitigation techniques, what gets you better phonon absorption, what gets you worse phonon absorption. Um, that, that'll come out in about a month, so I'm not going to show that today. The other one was, um, how would you redesign this whole system so that it was a dedicated sensor? Um, that, that's on the archive as of like 10 p.m. last night. Um, it's nice to impose deadlines on postdocs. I, I don't apologize. Um, <laughs> so um, we're calling this the, the superconducting quasi-particle ampl amplifying transmon. And I think you'll understand why in, in, in a couple slides. So the idea here is we take a transmon. Um, normally, this would be coupled to a readout resonator, right? You do that to isolate that, isolate it from the, the photon environment and the feed line. You do it to get a really high Q. What we're actually going after is we're going after high bandwidth readout. We don't care about coherence times. I don't need a coherent object. I just need this thing to be high enough Q that it maintains transmon-like um, transition frequencies. So we actually do a direct coupling to our feed line. So this whole thing is a Q of about 1,000 instead of 10 to the 9. Um, and then we tune the shape so that we get a, a dispersion so that our, our, our two parity bands are wide enough that we can read them out with that Q and no wider. Right? We want a, a high packing factor. We don't want to have a massive bandwidth in order to see the two parity states. Um, and then finally, we do the same bit of quasi-particle engineering we've been doing with our TES-based sensors. So we have a mostly aluminum um, set of islands. They're much bigger than you would have in a conventional transmon. They're sized the same way we do our um, TES-based phonon absorbers. And now the trap, instead of being a TES, the trap is actually uh, consists of a junction with the two um, launch pads you need when you do the style of junction. So in this, in this device, it's a Manhattan-style junction. Um, these are sort of the easiest junctions to make. So we're doing these first. We're moving to probably Dolan junctions in a year. But the real trick is making the, the islands out of aluminum and then making the actual junction out of aluminum manganese. So the aluminum manganese has a TC that's tunable, but sort of can be in the 100 to 200 millikelvin ballpark pretty easily. And so you still get this cascade where you have diffusion in the aluminum, trapping in the aluminum manganese, and then instead of using a TES to read out that energy, you have a very, very small junction region where the diffusion should be very efficient. And you're just trying to elevate the quasi-particle density in these leads for a long time so that the, the switching rate is uh, frequent and efficient. Um, so you can model this, right? Um, you you want to linearize the diffusion. So we would like the junction to be as close to this trapping region as possible. The leads, like, this part of the lead is totally useless. Yeah. Um, in the other study that's going to be coming out, we pretty much shown that like this is this is a zero dimensional system, so it doesn't really matter. Um, with the Dolan junctions, uh, you can you have more you know you you can make wider junctions. So we'd like to go to a wider, narrower junction to maintain the same, basically the same the same EJ, right? So. Um, we're working with Dave Schuster's group, who he, he's at Stanford as of January. So we've had like, you know, three of his students, three of my students in the lab. We have qubits with Manhattan junctions. We have fluxonium qubits. So all the processes are there. Um, and we're just focused on Manhattan right now because we need to get some devices to actually measure some critical features, which is, which is what I'm talking about now. So if we assume, basically we can take, we can take trapping rates from what we've measured for TES-based sensors. And then we, we estimate tunneling probabilities from there's actually a really nice paper where they use split transmons and they're just, they made different sizes and they, they measured the relative quasi-particle tunneling as a function of a, a variable that's a proxy for geometric size. Um, so one of my postdocs did this study of if, if we make the islands a certain size versus the traps a certain size, um, how many quasi-particles do we collect, right? So 0.1 would be a 10% efficiency, one would be a 100% efficiency. Um, using the trap, we can actually get efficiencies that exceed one. So this is why we call it a uh, quasi-particle amplifying transmon. So if I make the, uh, the collection efficient enough, I can actually get a gain factor. One quasi-particle in my aluminum fin becomes something like 10 to 15 tunneling events 
in my junctions because I can actually get multiple tunneling events, right? This isn't an asymmetric junction where a, a tunneling event happens and then there's an energetic barrier going back and forth. It's a symmetric junction. So if the tunneling happens one way, my quasi-particle is already at the gap edge, it can tunnel back. So the hope is you make quasi-particle lifetimes long enough and the junction volume small enough that you can see the same quasi-particle many times and you can increase your probability of detecting it and the number of times you detect it. Um, we've also looked at what would happen if you get rid of the trap. This, this has a, a nice effect of also kind of being an estimation of if you make a transmon of a certain size, how much phonon energy that gets into the transmon will actually get to your junction. And you find that if you don't have this trap for anything that's like reasonably sized for gigahertz transmons, you really don't have a very high probability of interaction. So it's something like 10 to the minus four. So you really do need like cosmic ray energy events in order to see significant degradation in the coherence of the qubit. So the difference between these two trends really is the presence of the trap. You can make a very small transmon, which, you know, uh, would either be very low frequency or very high, you know, you can do something outside of the typical gigahertz range and get to the 1% efficiency. That might be useful for a photon detector. That's something we're looking into. For photon detectors, we really want to be out on the, the longer side for the islands. And so we know we need this trap in order to get um, good efficiencies. Um, and the first thing we really want to do, though, is we want to measure these, these, uh, these factors better. So we, in terms of energy resolution, for our standard assumptions, um, with, a, with a fairly large island, we can actually, we expect to be able to get sensitivities down to the aluminum gap. This would be, let's, let's call this part of the plot the, the two-year problem and this part of the plot the five-year problem, right? So this assumes we can make really nice aluminum manganese junctions. The diffusion in those junctions is very efficient. Um, there's no additional phase noise in our system, right? So like lots of assumptions. Um, I think the like 15 to 30 milliEV scale we, have a, we can do a lot of things wrong and still achieve that. And in the paper we have, um, we vary both the trapping efficiency and tunneling efficiency by a factor of 10. And there's always this 15 milli EV line in this plot. So we think with our initial devices, with the whatever first traps we can generate, this should, this should be TESs pretty handily, pretty quickly. Um, we're just relying on the fact that transmons are already really nice parity switch encounters. Um, we're also looking at uh, doing this with photon detection. So this shows the um, number of quasi-particles you detect per absorbed photon as a function of photon frequency. And we're trying to go down into this terahertz range. And so for, again, for the high frequency photons, not, not a hard sensing problem. Um, if we can really optimize this, we can, we can probably get down to the terahertz, uh, single terahertz um, photon detection, almost into the gigahertz range. Um, so yeah, this, oh, okay, good, I did add it. Yeah, yeah, so this, this shows some of the variation if you make some more pessimistic assumptions for tunneling um, and trapping rate. Um, and so you get closer to an EV in both, case, both cases, but we're optimizing for geometries in this area. So, you know, we're still sort of sub 10 milli EV in an optimistic case. And when you add in realistic assumptions, I think we'll still be under 100 milli EV for first devices. So where are we now? Um, they're packaging devices today, actually. So we expect to have results on the time scale of a month. Um, these are aluminum only devices. Uh, we're doing some aluminum manganese junction development over the next three months. We'll have our first trap based devices early next year. So I'll come back in two years, I'll tell you how it went. Um, but yeah, so it's been great. Uh, my big takeaway is it's really nice to have a a big fab facility and don't have to buy your own e-beam tools and evaporators and stuff. Uh, Otherwise, this would have taken a long, a long time. Um, the acronym is, is SQUAT. I'm not thrilled about that. But again, when you give the postdocs a deadline, they get to name the sensor and, you know, superconducting quasi-particle amplifying transmon. There were worse ones, believe me. Um, that's, that's also my, my new DR is called Olaf for the same reason, which is hilarious, but, you know. Your name is Lindley's DR. I know. Okay. I found that out after they named it because I gave them a deadline. Um, okay. And then I, I think I'm, I'm short on time. So I'm going to try to get through the rest of these slides fairly quickly. The last thing we've been doing is we've been trying to think. So we've talked about um, trying to understand photons and qubits. We tracked, uh, we've talked a little bit about making qubit based sensors for phonon detection. The last question is just like if I, if I took a conventional qubit array, can that already say something about dark matter? 
Um, so you can just you can just look at like the Boltzmann equation for if I have some power injection into a superconductor and I have recombination and trapping, what does my steady state quasi particle density look like? You get some some relation. Uh, in the trapping case, this uh, the power sensitivity is much worse than the recombination case. Um, and the, the 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 short answer is it's not interesting, which it's kind of nice to know. So dark matter will not be the reason that superconducting uh, quantum computing doesn't work. So you can't blame us. Um, <clears throat> if 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 a lot of factors aligned, though, you could actually drag the sensitivity down into interesting parameter space. But it would really have to be um, it would have to be a really weird superconductor. So. Um, we don't really have a validated model for how equilibrium QP density um, relaxes. We think it's tunneling dominated. You'd have to find a recombination dominated superconductor. Um, sorry, not tunneling, trapping dominated. Um, the tunneling probability across the junction is really not well modeled. And so that's something we're trying to measure, but it's not, it's not gonna drag this by more than a factor of 10. Um, and there are lots of other mechanisms for producing non-equilibrium non QPs, right? Including radiation. So. Um, those are much more energetic and frequent than dark matter. So, yeah, this is good. This was an idea that was bouncing around the dark matter community. I think we pretty much said, no, it, this isn't a problem. Um, <clears throat> so the final thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, let's, let's call it quantum materials. This is what Yoni and Peter and I have been working on. Um, I won't spend that much time on it, but again, you, you know where their offices are, um, and they, they have a, a lot more interesting things to say on the theory side than I do. I'm just the guy making the electron blip detector. Um, but the idea here is instead of trying to use the same substrates and re-engineer the sensor, what if you use the same sensor and re-engineer the substrate? So I use silicon, 1.2 EV band gap. What if we use the milli EV band gap and we use the same charge sensor? Um, so we've been working with Los Alamos on a bunch of materials. Um, these are some plots for this, uh, I think it's a lanthanide compound, 526. Um, in order to understand particle scattering, you need to understand the loss function, which means you need to do um, eels and x-ray scattering to be able to even calculate the scattering rate in these materials. But then beyond that, you generate some charge, you need to drift the charge and measure the charge. Um, there's a lot of really interesting work going on in this space that I am not super familiar with, but uh, our colleagues at Lanol are very familiar with. Um, and then there's a lot of really great measurement techniques that can be done here. Um, so. Um, we've measured some of these materials. So 526, we've, we've shown that um, you can collect almost 100% um, of the charge in the substrate. You get about 30 to 40 electrons per photon, per optical photon, um, compared to silicon. That's silicon's one. So silicon's here. So it's a gain of 40 already. Um, you need a really high field, though. So it's, it's a kind of a different regime than uh, the, the, the materials we're used to working with. Um, and then we're making this uh, DC hemmed based two stage cryogenic amplifier, which we, we project should have uh, about five electron resolution. Um, uh, this is a measurement from July. Uh, we're close. We're about a factor of five from the ultimate sensitivity. And um, the, the most recent spectra coming out of our fridge look pretty good. They look better than this. So, you know, we get decent gain, but the, the, whole, the whole strategy with this thing is read out a really small chunk of something at 10 millikelvin, get it to four Kelvin to do your amplification um, and try to minimize charge resolution. This is about as good as we can do with conventional hemp that we can purchase. They have gates that go down to about a, a picofarad in capacitance. Um, if you could make one that's smaller, it would help, but it only scales with square root capacitance. So you have to go to like femtofarads, which is, which is what CCDs do. Um, and so the last trick you could imply is using, again, using these uh, charge sensitive qubits as charge amplifiers by actively feed, feeding back on the image charge. Um, there's a really nice concept paper um, from, uh, from a um, circuit QED group in France that talks about how you would do this. As far as I can tell, no one's realized that we're gonna try to, to, to work on it. You basically, you, you take a, a Cooper pair box electrometer and add a feedback gate and do some interesting RF readout. So um, there's a lot of detail in that paper. I'd refer you to that paper to look at more. I don't have any interesting uh, sensors for you yet, but in about a year, we should have some sensors that sort of follow this general topology. Um, there's a group at Dartmouth that has done a lot of work on electrometry. And so in an open loop uh, context, they've gotten a resolution of 10 to the minus three electrons. Um, you basically take this design out of feedback gate and you, you should be able to do this. So we're really interested to try it. 
Um, the final thing I want to mention the, in the dark matter context are axion searches. This, this should be a very short aside. Um, axions are basically it's a it's a scalar field that can convert to a photon. Um, uh, and that's probably wrong, but I'm sorry about that. Um, there, there are these well-known targets for what a cosmological axion could be in terms of cross, uh, cross section versus mass. The high mass region is not very well covered. Um, and sort of towards the high mass end is the single terahertz photon detection regime. So on the sensor side, there is a need for single photon detectors in this regime. It's the same energy scale as what we've been talking about. Um, you need something like detection, detection sensitivity of a, a photon per day for a, honestly, for an optimistically sized experiment. Um, and the way that we propose to do this is in bread is we build basically what is a, a giant axion telescope. So you get um, this parabolic reflector, axion conversion happens in the magnetic field here. It ends up focused at the, at the center of the, the reflector. And then any quantum sensor you build that can do single terahertz photon detection, you can sort of put at the focus and use the, amplif the amplification of the reflector in order to get um, all of your signal to a very small area. So um, my involvement in this is really uh, focused on understanding how to make sensors that can get sensitivity down to this axion target. You can see there's a huge technological gap right now. Um, the optimization is different. It's actually a little bit more friendly to um, uh, easier optimization techniques than phonon sensing is. You can make much smaller devices and use lenslets, for example. Um, so we're working on it. One thing that we found interesting was that our sensors that we've made already kind of look like bow tie antennas, which are well established um, as, as potential antennas in the terahertz. So we're, we're looking at redesigning this. So we get a transmon that basically looks like this a little junction and trying to get it to be in roughly the right frequency range. Um, this is hard. This is sort of calibration problems as well. So this is a longer term effort, but I also think it's scientifically, this would be a, a really useful device beyond dark matter. So I'm excited about it. So um, conclusions, I think, this low mass dark matter space, for me at least, is, is interesting in that it gives us a really nice reason to go after low energy regimes for sensing. They're very hard problems. I think the synergy between quantum information and sensing is actually very strong. It's not, we're not really stretching to say that, uh, you know, qubit design and sensor design are, you know, Synergistic, they really are. I'm, I'm learning a lot from my colleagues that are that are just working on superconducting qubits, and I think vice versa. Um, and combining our cryogenic expertise has been really useful. Um, so there's a lot of stuff springing up in this space. This is just my particular flavor. There's there's just sort of a huge explosion of these sorts of things. So if you're interested, there's a lot more literature out there that you might be interested in reading. Um, this is my group. This is us. I think this is the tallest fridge I've seen. So someone try to beat me, but I can fit my whole group under the fridge. Um, uh, we have this new really nice cryogenic facility at Slack um, with a bunch of DRs. Uh, so this is this is mine, which is sort of more focused on uh, longer experiments. We have a fast turnaround fridge and we're bringing up a new superconducting foundry, but we have a lot of excited young people and a lot of close collaborators that, that make the work really fun. Um, and yeah, we're starting a bunch of new stuff at Slack. So we're hiring, we're doing a lot of um, uh, cryogenic sensor fabrication and testing development. So uh, if you are looking for a postdoc or a staff job and you want to work on this stuff, you should send me an email. Thanks. Okay, uh, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. So the question is, how many of these chip sensors, whatever, could you fit in some small area volume? Yeah. So for that, we're there's already experiments um, for like cosmic microwave background detection where you can do multiplexing factors on a single RF line of like a thousand. So um, the design I talked about, you know, we're low Q and we want the splitting to be only large enough so that we can determine the difference between the two states. That's really to enable multiplexing. So we have a splitting of roughly two megahertz between states, which means roughly 10 megahertz per resonator. So 100, 100 resonators per, or not 100 qubits per gigahertz, 
it's not as good as something like kids where you can get about a thousand per two gigahertz, I think, but um, it does scale better. And then you can use all of the same RF multiplexing hardware warm to do the readout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're still really limited by like the intrinsic sensitivity per sensor. Um, all of these assume like one sensor per substrate or like for photon detection absorption of one sensor. And then are you asking about packing factor? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So this is all incoherent detection, so it doesn't help you that much. Right. So if you, for ideal noise sources, if you had some sort of like correlated phase noise or correlated charge noise, that helps. But, but for photon detection, phonon counting, it doesn't help at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we have, that's why I like this. So we have like for scattering, KEV to MEV means milliEV to EV and for axions, you just think of it as it converts right to a photon. And so an axion from 100 gigahertz, which is a few hundred micro EV all the way up to 100 milliEV is viable. All you need is like a 10 Tesla field and something to convert them to photons, right? But it's still not like in a mine somewhere. So it, it's still like feasible. Um, and there's a lot of efforts, especially, I, you know, I'm DOE, within DOE to buy a bunch of magnets so that you can bring your experiment to a magnet. And that makes all of this a lot easier. It's nice. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. It's just the it's the rate balance of you know you have a quasi particle it enters a high gap area and there's a probability for it to emit a phonon and that phonon either will or won't break Cooper pairs, right? So it's just it's just the balance between sub gap and above gap phonons, and almost every material. So right, your TC is determined by your electron phonon coupling constant, and so if you're using something with similar TC, it's going to have a similar limitation. Um, higher electron phonon coupling constant doesn't actually help you because the gap is higher. So more of your phonons are incapable of breaking Cooper pairs. So it ends up balancing out. So I've seen like 50 to 70% for a whole range of materials. The 30% number is because we have two down conversion steps. So if you like something like kids, it's actually 60%. There's one down conversion step. Uh, in practice, the kids are massive though. That's my, that's my big problem is you, you can't get away from that volume limitation. And so we're trying, but again, like the, you know, Sunil's best device for phonon sensing is 2EV. And we think we can do better, but it, it's, it's, you're hitting the same limitations as TS is like, it's already a big thing. And then you got to do a trap. And if you're going to do a trap, then there's parasitic inductance. And then this sort of geometry ends up helping. Um, and then you'd still need a capacitor that hurts you. I'll just ask one more. So, I mean, maybe the, you know, another definition of quantum 2.0 is like somehow involving entanglement. So I guess they're like, there, there are debates as to like what constitutes an actual quantum sensor. And they're like, you know, in the most aggressive sort of definition of this, it's, you have to use entanglement somehow. Um, is that ever going to help? Or are we, um, you know, is, is the best you can do just to multiplex a bunch of stuff incoherently? I think for these techniques, we're at too high an energy scale. And, and too rare an event for entangle, entanglement to help all that much. But to be honest, I haven't thought about it that hard. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that is that is probably real quantum measurement, right? But um, you you don't destroy the coherence unless the unless you have a parity switching event. Like so, if you don't, if if you generate quasi particles in the island, and they don't diffuse and to the junction and tunnel, for the most part, you'll maintain your coherence. Your loss will be a little bit worse because you'll have something to lose energy to. But what we've seen is like the the initial events are like um, mega EV, right? So you don't you you don't need you only need a deficiency of ten to the minus eight to get one quasi particle to ruin your coherence. For like 
um, there's there's groups studying IR photons, and you know one IR photon doesn't generally ruin your coherence every time. So it's it, it is sort of a trade off. But if the energy if the energy is enough, you'll always get a tunneling event. You'll always ruin coherence. Questions? Okay, so thank you all again.